the first time last year at Camp Jackson. Uh, many of you that were there at camp with us, and we just had an incredible encounter with God. Um, it was just powerful. We asked him to come to our event. I've been praying about it and feeling who I, I just wanted somebody else besides me to speak this year, and I, I just felt him, and he said, yes, I'll come, I'll do this, and then I did a little dance uh, in my office. And uh, so anyway, uh, tonight, if you guys would pay attention, listen very carefully, he's got an incredible heart and incredible uh, message to share with you tonight. If you guys would welcome uh, Mr. Chris Brooks. I don't like people sneaking up behind me and stuff. You get jack locked yeah. up. You know? Let me see. Is this all right up here? Should I could wherever you want to, like man? Jolly Green Giant up here. Come down. Yeah, let's come down. Let's do that because right now I like the spitting section anyway. These guys down here. But that's better. That'll work right there. Now I can get your attention. First of all, I want to say this, that if you guys don't win something at Fine Arts, Jeremy all still has rigged that thing because that was thinking awesome. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, give it up for you guys. That, that was awesome. It's probably one of the best in the videos I've seen in a long time. And I'm serious. Are you excited now? Did you copy it from somebody? That was the worst human video I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> There's like, man, we didn't even come up with that. That's horrible. Uh, one thing that I've been doing since I have been doing this and ministering is I make sure that I want your generation to understand that you have to become a generation of honor. Because without honor, you're not going to go very far in life. And we need to learn how to honor those and give honor to where honor is due. So I want you guys to give it up for Pastor Adam here for all these young folks tonight. Um, I know you've got a lot of festivities and stuff that's after the service tonight, but like what Pastor Adam was saying, I want you to really pay attention. I want to go ahead and throw out a disclaimer tonight. I know that this is a student youth conference or youth um, night, whatever it is that you want to call it, but I am not here to talk to you like a student. I'm not here to talk to you like a youth. I'm here to talk to you like mature men and women of God that are ready to receive the meat of the Word of God and not just here to receive some weak little milk. Amen? So I want you to pay attention. I want you to listen because we're going to hit this thing running and we're going to uh, try to go through a, quite a bit of stuff here that God has given us. Um, over the past couple of months here, the Lord has been stirred in my heart and we began and um, I, let me tell you who I am for those of you who don't know. I'm Pastor Chris Brooks. I'm over in Chattanooga, Tennessee out of Abba's house with Pastor Ron Phillips. This is my wife, Davey Brooks, up here. She is smoking hot and I'm so glad she got to come with me because she don't really doesn't get what y'all have a problem with my wife being hot. Look, when one day you're going to want to get married, you're going to hope that your wife's hot. So just go ahead and prep and prepare for that. But um, she got to come with us this weekend and everything, and so I love having her with me. So I just want to get that out of the way. The beginning of the year, we just started just seeking after what it was that God wanted for us. And like everybody else, we decided, well, what is our New Year's resolutions? What are the things that we're going to start trying to set some goals and get prepared for what it is we want to do throughout the year? And then God's like, you're going to set goals, right? Yeah. How many did you complete last year? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not many. And that's normally what happens to people. People start to set their New Year's resolutions and they get a piece of paper out and they write down a bunch of goals or things that they want to accomplish throughout the year and they've got 15 or 20 goals and then they just get completely overwhelmed with all of them because they didn't complete a single goal that they tried to set out and do last year and then what ends up happening by March they take the piece of paper, wad it up and throw it away and they don't do anything and they say well we'll just start over next year. And we'll try to do something next year. And a friend of mine began to speak to me, or uh, let me back up, before he spoke to me, I heard the Lord say, I want you to simplify some things in your life. And I want you to simplify all of these things that you're looking at, Chris, because all of them you're going to be able to accomplish once you find out the one thing that it is that I'm trying to say to you and the one word it is that I have for you. And God began to speak to me and said, Chris, I want you to find one word and in this one word, you're going to encompass everything that you do throughout the entire year. 
Everything that you do, the way that you live your life, the way that you read, the way that you pray, the way that you communicate, this one word is going to be the entire engulfing thing that you do and nothing that does not line up with this one word will you allow into your life, nor will you allow any outside relationships or anybody into this sphere that I'm giving you right now because this one word is about to do something miraculous in your life. Then a friend of mine began to show me a book which was called One Word That Will Change Your Life, which was a devotional by John Gordon. And I read this and started doing the devotion and things began to take place in my life. I started seeing things like I've never saw them before. And God led me to a scripture in Psalms 97 verse 4. And David is sitting there speaking and he says this. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David said, let there be one thing and that one thing may I desire with all of my heart and that one thing may I look after with all of my heart. May I gaze upon that one thing and not look in any other direction or allow, allow anything else to come in and try to steal that one thing, God, that I'm looking for. And David said, the one thing that I want is to dwell in the house of the Lord. The one thing that I'm after is to be in your presence. And he said, that one thing changed my life. And in that, God began to send me to some more scriptures. And the word that God began to encompass around us was the word of tonight. We've sang a song about it. It's written on a board out there. And that word is changed. Changed as in already taken place. If you were to read Romans chapter 4 verse 17, that scripture declares to call those things into existence as though they are even though they're not existing at the prior moment. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because if we say we want something to change, we can hope in change. We can look for change. But if I say you are already changed, that means it has already taken place and it has already happened. We're looking for not something to come. We're saying God has already established your life. He has already changed some things. He's just waiting on you to catch up to where he is. For so long, we've been back here looking for the change, and God says, no, it's not behind you, because you can't change anything from yesterday. It's not in the present form right now, because this day has already taken place, but tomorrow can be changed. And it can only be changed when you decide that you want it to be changed. Are you with me? So one word for 365 days will line up everything and encompass everything in our lives by the word changed. Let me show you the scripture tonight that we're going to stay in. One scripture is all I have for you. It's Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2. I don't know if we were able to do anything tonight, but it's easy. We can read this to you. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Let me say it again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. So we're going to take this scripture and we're going to break this scripture down tonight and then we're going to end up wherever it is that God wants us to end up and we're going to do whatever it is God wants us to do because that's what we've been singing for the past hour. Amen? Amen. Are y'all with me tonight? Okay, here we go. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. If we're going to be transformed, first we've got to understand what it means to be conformed or what God's saying here about not being conformed. Do not be conformed to what is around you. Another version, or if you take that word and break it down in the scripture, it says do not fashion yourselves to things that would begin to affect your environment and change the very fabric of who you are. Do not fashion yourself around certain things People, certain circles of influence, certain groups, certain things that you allow into yourself. He said, don't fashion yourselves to these things because those things will begin to torment or begin to destroy the very environment that God is trying to establish on the inside of you. Because if you stop and look, about, look at this thing, conformity is actually boring. If we all dress the same, if we all look the same, 
if we all uh, uh, had, the, had the same clothes on, if we all had the same hairstyle, and I'm pretty sure right now you're looking at me and saying, no. So, you know, and I say the same thing every day when I wake up in the morning. I'm like, my God, why? You know, I had a great head of hair like a year ago. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm just, I'm still working this thing out with my salvation, guys, so help me here. The more that we conform, the more that we're just like a monkey with no brain, monkeying around, doing our own thing, trying to follow the butt that's in front of us. They did, they did some kind of research with caterpillars or these little worms, and they put these worms in a bucket. Now, a worm by itself will crawl out of the bucket. Three worms in there will do nothing but go around in a circle in the bottom of the bucket following the butt in front of it. And that's what our society has looked like. We're just walking around following butts, following butts, following butts, following butts. We can't even look up to see that there's stuff going on in this world because we've got our eyes focused on the butt in front of us. He said butt in church. Listen, we got our eyes focused on this person in front of us because the reason we're looking at them is because we really don't like who we are. And we really don't have an identity in Christ, so we got to be something that we're not and look like something that we're not. Now we're stagnant in a place of conformity and play, instead of being transformed into who it is that God wants us to be. The reason that people conform, watch this, I wrote this down and I want to read it the way I wrote it. The reason that people conform to certain circles of influence is because of a fear of rejection. The pressure to conform and avoid rejection is so powerful that Christians will also compromise in order to gain some sense of acceptance. I'm going to say that again because some of you look at me like a deer in headlights. I told you we're going somewhere tonight, right? Pay attention. To the pressure to conform and avoid rejection is so powerful that even Christians will also compromise their faith in order to gain some sense of of acceptance, all the while denying the fact that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead has quickened your mortal body and has done a work on the inside of you, but we really don't believe that scripture. We just want to conform to everything that's going on around us instead of understanding when the Bible says that it quickened your mortal body, it means that it physically did something different to you. If you've ever been touched by the presence of God, you felt His presence. There is a tangible presence that you can feel. There is something tangible that will grab a hold of you and change you and keep you from ever looking back ever again in your life if you will allow it to actually get inside of you instead of just getting on you. Yeah. There's a big difference of something getting on you and then something getting inside of you. Because we can walk outside right now and it will be raining and the rain can get on me. But if I don't jump in a swimming pool, I am then immersed. Yeah. Are you with me? I'm then immersed in the thing that I want all around me, encompassing me and on the inside of me. To conform is to compromise our faith in Jesus Christ. When you conform to this world, you are compromising your very faith of who Christ is by allowing the enemy. Oh my God in heaven. Let me back up. I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm so, I'm jacked right now and I'm trying to slow down. And when I get this way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip something because I'm talking so fast. I'm going to slow down and make sure that I don't. Watch this. Conformity is compromising our faith in who Christ is. The Bible says, deny me before man and I will deny you before my father. And here is the denying factor of your generation. And it is that Satan has brought silence upon your life and has kept you quiet. Yeah. Yeah. You are the greatest multimedia generation that the world has ever seen. You are smarter when it comes to computers. You are smarter when it comes to cell phones. When a new piece of equipment comes out, I've got a 14-year-old daughter. When I get an iPhone, she's never even seen the iPhone, and she can work that stupid thing a lot better than her daddy can that's had it for a year. I'm like, how do you know what's going on? You don't even have an iPhone. She goes, well, my friend does. How long did you play with your friend's phone? About five minutes. And in five minutes, you can do all this stuff. It's like a transformer in your hand. You can make that phone do stuff, and I'm sitting here going, Siri, where do I find coffee? Um, I, I can't help you with that right now. I'm going to kill you if you don't tell me where the coffee is. 
And she can go on there. And she said it's because I don't have the right language. And I've got mine set up to a girl that speaks English. She has her set up to a guy that speaks Australian. And, and I'm kind of mad about this. Because, because whenever she talks to me, he goes, Hello, princess. And I was like, Do you sit down and shut up? Because I you don't need no Australian guy on there telling you that you're a princess. Your daddy tells you you're a princess and he can go back to Syria land or wherever he came from. <laughs> Messing with me, stinking phone. Here's what happens though you guys can talk and text. And FaceTime, well, not FaceTime. Let's get on FaceTime because you don't, half of you don't even do that. But when you do the Instagram and maybe you do Facebook or whatever, you, you do that for hours. But sit in a room just you and one other person and you can't hold a conversation for five minutes. You can't talk face to face with somebody for five minutes, which is why, look at me, which is why there's so many lost people in your school. church uh -oh. because we're on the stupid phone the whole time and we don't set it down in order to have some interaction listen to me jesus don't text he don't have instagram he wouldn't be on facebook and he would probably be disgusted if he had a facebook looking at yours oh, or what's it posted on instagram oh, yeah. come on yeah stupid dumb face is. Dumb face for us used to be when you take two Pringles and you stick them in your mouth and you those down and those up. That's what we call them. My daughter goes, they're doing dumb face. I was like, they don't have Pringles in your mouth. What are, what are you talking about, Dad? I'm going to kill somebody. They're going to get hurt. This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to keep you silent. Because look at me. When he's got you silent, you're right where he wants you. But you don't even notice that you're silent because you're conforming to everybody else that is around you because they're silent. Because they don't talk about anything. Not anything controversial. They're not going to go to talk anything. They're not going to really get into a deep God conversation with you because they don't want to and because they don't know how. And then the reason that we don't do it is because we feel inadequate about talking about it. Because we're not even really sure who we are and really sure in what we're doing because we are the part of the conformity that has taken place inside of everything around us. So we find ourselves caught right in the middle of this thing trying to figure out how to get out. Yeah. And God the whole time saying, don't be conformed to the things around you. Do not be conformed to the lie of the enemy. Do not be conformed to the silence. Do not be conformed to legalistic religion that man is trusting of a hyper grace that there is no hell. Some of you may or may not have heard that I'm sick and tired of the hyper grace that there is no hell and everybody's going to heaven. No, sir, it's not that way. There is a hell and it's made for people that want to enjoy the world and the pleasures of the flesh and not come to the fullness of knowing who Christ is as Lord and Savior. God does not send anybody to hell. You choose to go there. Do you hear me? God's not going to send you to hell. But he has no choice but to let you go there. Yeah. If you decide not to follow after his word. To follow after his will. To follow after what it is. He's saying, I'm sick and tired of the conformity here. I need somebody to stand up and change. You're running after the pleasures of the flesh. Running after all this stuff. Thinking that you're actually enjoying what you're doing. Because you're caught up in the middle of it. Listen to me, people that stick needles in their arms and shoot up heroin think that they're having a great time at the moment, but when it's all said and done and they look back, they're like, what was I even thinking? Yeah. Because they got caught up in something that they shouldn't have been in. I was in a conference last night in Chattanooga with Teen Challenge and all of the different stories of all the people up there from heroin addicts, from uh, meth addicts, from three kids at home. She gets arrested and, and, and the, her kids almost get taken away from her because she leaves them at home to go strip at night to make money for her meth addiction. Wow. I sat next to a young man that was a pastor that is now in Team Challenge that moved to San Francisco. Out in San Francisco, he began to get encompassed or get surrounded with a group of people that thought that it was okay to go ahead and social drink a little bit in order to win other people to Christ. So through the social drinking, this kid becomes 
becomes an alcoholic and almost loses his marriage. He lost his ministry and is now in a teen challenge program trying to get his life right because instead of going in and changing things, which was what he wanted to do, he allowed the things and the environment around him to bring conformity into his life yeah. instead of standing for what it is. Because listen to me. I know it's hard to stand, but it's worth it. Yeah. And I know what it feels like to give in, and it's definitely not worth it. He's saying, do not be conformed to what's going on inside of this world, but be transformed. Listen to me, true joy is given only by the Holy Spirit. True joy is given by the Holy Spirit. I can enjoy this world and have fun and not be subjected to the things around me and try to control me. Do you understand that? Because I don't want you to think, well, man, I can't do nothing. I can't have fun. I can't go out and do No. Listen to me. God made this world for us. He put us here to take dominion of this world and to enjoy it. The problem gets is to where the things that you enjoy now become the things that control you and keep you from doing other things. Are y'all hearing me? I don't know if you got this problem here, but we have people that, we, we got some incredible athletes in our student group. We got some, some incredible football players and soccer players and baseball players, but you, you know what's happened? The football has now become the God. The soccer ball has now become the God. The, the tennis racket has now become the God. And, 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 and for me, as a, as a student pastor, I want to grab some parents and I want to shake them. And I'm like, you know what you're doing? You think that you're giving your kid this way out and they're going to have a great college education and all this stuff. But you don't understand that the one thing that you're subjecting them from is church. And are you kidding me? That, that, that you went and, and, and good kids that said, I'm going to go into this sport to win people to Christ, never see them again. Yeah. Till the sport's over. And guess where they are when the sport's over? Right here, on the floor, crying out, asking for forgiveness for conforming to something that they went in to try to change. But here's the reason that they couldn't change they hadn't been transformed. They had a good idea, but the transformation process had not taken part or taken a hold of who they are. Do not be conformed to this world. Are you with me? Yes. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed in the Greek means metamorphosis. It means that it is changed into something that cannot be changed back. When he says be transformed, you're being so changed to where there's no way you would want to or no way to where it would be possible for you to change back. Everybody in this room knows the scripture. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You don't get that scripture. Nobody understands it. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Old things are passed away. All things become new. What you do is, is you take these old things like it's a jacket and you go hang it in the closet and when nobody's looking, you go back to the closet and put the jacket back on. You look at old things like that. Literally what the Bible is saying, old things have died and are buried in death and there's no way that the old dead man can come back and live inside of the new man. So we've got to look at the old things as the things that have died, been buried, and cannot be resurrected ever again. Are you hearing me? So it's not taking the jacket off and hanging it up in a closet. It's taking the jacket off, taking it to a burn barrel, burning that stinking thing, saying, you're dead. And in the ashes, there's no way that you can come back and get back on me and turn me back into the person that I used to be. I'm preaching better than y'all listening in this place tonight. Come on, I'll have a little feedback. It's okay. All right? If you don't, if you want to say amen, hallelujah, I'm fine with that. You're not boosting my ego. When you, I'm, I'm wanting something to get in you. Yeah. I want you to be excited. I want you to be excited about the things of God. I don't want you to be the next generation church that's silent. We've had enough of that. I've had plenty of it, and I'm tired of it myself. <laughs> so here we are. We need to be transformed. How are we transformed? What is the metamorphosis that takes place? Here we go. Back to the caterpillar. Caterpillar's going to do something. Caterpillar's going to go through a death stage. 
He goes through a death stage of a cocoon. He gets inside of that cocoon. He wolves himself up in there just like a grave. And in a couple of weeks, he's going to come out of that thing and he's going to be a butterfly. And instead of crawling around on the ground, now he's going to be flying and soaring in the air. Why would that butterfly ever want to go back and crawl around on a leaf again or crawl around on the ground? Doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Doesn't make any sense at all to want to go back. The Bible says that whenever we become Christians and we give our heart over to God, we go through a burial process which is called baptism. In baptism, we go into what is a watery grave. The Bible says that you were, when you go into that water, and what we say in our church all the time is buried with Christ in baptism unto death and raised to walk in newness of life. Same way as Jesus died, went into a grave, came out of that grave and is alive today, you go through the same process. So the water is actually your grave. So if you've been baptized, in that moment, you were baptized into death. And things died to then be raised up and walk in newness of life. You were a sinner, but you are no longer a sinner. Now you are a saint. I'm sick and tired of hearing people say we are sinners saved by grace. No, you are not. Yes. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner who is saved by grace. And I'm no longer that sinner any longer. Because watch this. This is freeing a lot of my students because they've just they've heard this. This isn't even biblical. This is just man's theology saying some things. Come on. If you declare that you're a sinner saved by grace, your identity is still in sin. Come on. I'm a sinner saved by God. Your identity is sin. Mm -hmm. But until you change your identity to be a sinner that was saved by grace through the saving process that takes place, you have now been justified. You are no longer a sinner, but you are a saint. And throughout your life's process, you are now being sanctified. And he who endures to the end shall be saved. Are you hearing me? So Paul does not write to the church at Corinth and say to all the sinners in Corinth. He does not write to the church of Ephesus and say to all the sinners of Ephesus. He didn't write to Galatia and say to all the sinners of Galatia. He says to all the saints of Corinth, to all the saints of Ephesus, to all the saints of Galatia, your identity has to be in Christ. Yes. You have to know exactly who you are, what you are, and what is on the inside of you. So we shouldn't be saying these comments, no, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I was, but I'm not anymore. Yes. I, I'm a saint. Now, do I sin? Sometimes. But guess what? i got an advocate. His name's Jesus. And that, that doesn't give me the free sin ticket to go around saying, I'm saying I'm sin all I want. No, I don't think so. No, that's not the way it's going to happen. But if you do sin, the Bible says he's sitting there making petitions for God for you yes. in that exact moment. So we're not sinners any longer. We are saints that live by God that are being sanctified. There's a transformation that takes place. If you want to see transformation in your city, or in your schools, or in your churches, if you want to see true revival, or in your youth group, the first transformation has to take place in you. And the place it's going to start is in a body part that's about six inches. It's called your brain. This is where the transformation begins. I encourage you, if you've never read the book by Joyce Meyer, The Battlefield of the Mind, get it and read it. I've made all my students read it. I've taken them from chapter 1 all the way through that book and we've done a weekly study on the battlefield of the mind because you are who you are because of the way that you think of who you are. And as long as you think that that's who you are, that's who you will always be until you first change your mind and don't see things the way that others see things but begin to see things the way that God sees things. you got to change the way that you view things. you got to change the way that you look. you got to change of what you see. Look here, Saul is standing with the army of Israel across the battlefield looking at a giant and they see a nine foot giant. They see a bunch of armor. They see a super soldier. That's what they see. Then David shows up and David walks up and he sees what the Bible says here. And I love how he says it. David shows up and says, I see an uncircumcised Philistine that is defying the army of the Lord. He saw something totally different than what the military saw. He saw something totally different than...
than what the king saw. But the crazy thing is, David saw what God saw. And when you see what God sees, things begin to change around you. Listen to me, guys. Your Goliath may be big in your eyes, but it is small and minute in God's eyes. It is so small. You need to declare today that you will never look with the eyes of conformity, but be transformed and changed to see what God sees. That's what you need to do. We're going to see how it is that God sees. We see blind eyes. God sees sight. We see people that are lame in wheelchairs. God sees them up walking around. We see cancer. God sees health. We see divorce. God sees restoration. We see a whore sitting next to a well, and Jesus walks up and sees a daughter of God. Yeah. Hey, same thing. You see that same girl sitting at the table of lunch. You know what she's done. Everybody knows what she's done. But are you going to look at her the way that everybody else sees her, or are you going to see a daughter of God? You see a homosexual, God sees a missionary to Thailand. Why do I know that? Because eight years ago, when I moved to Chattanooga, I had a young man in my youth group that was full-blown homosexual, had a boyfriend, told me straight up his lifestyle, and said, this is who I am. I've been in church my whole life, and I'm never going back. I'm going to live this lifestyle. You want to know where he is today? Well, today he's married to a beautiful woman of God, and today he's a missionary in Thailand. So you can see however you want to see, but I'm going to see what God sees. And God sees them changed. God sees them set free. Come on. God don't see you in your chains that you're in tonight. And don't tell me you're not in chains. I can see it during worship. Because true worshipers don't care who's looking at them. Mm -hmm. yeah. True worshipers really don't care who is in here and who's among us and who's around us. Because their eyes are here. They're not here. They're not here. They're not there. They're right here. Could care less. Not that we don't care about the people around us. There's a point and there's a place for that. But in the moment of worship, all attention turns to Him. Because it's all about Him. That, that, that is our position as Christians, as believers, to come and worship the true God. Yeah. So if we're going to stay away or to leave conformity and be transformed in the renewing of our mind, the word then declares that we're going to be tested by this. See, me, me, most people don't want to hear that. Most people don't want to hear, oh, great, now I've got to go through a test. Yeah, you're going to go through a test. God says, I'm going to test you by this, and you need to have discernment. If there's anything that your generation needs, it's discernment. You're too gullible. Yeah. You just believe anything that anybody says. Instead of taking what it is that you've heard and then go measure it against the word of God. This is your measuring tool. This is your canon. This is your standard. This is what it is that you need to measure. Everything that you go by. Everything that you live by. The only reason that you would not crack open this Bible to live by the standard of what somebody else had told you is because your flesh really wants to do it. And you really want to do whatever it is that you want to do. And you don't want to hear what God wants you to do. Because you know God may tell you no. Come on. And we don't want to hear God tell us no. So we don't even go to God about it. Until it's already too late. And then we're asking for forgiveness. Man it would have been a lot easier if we had gone there the first time. And heard God say no. And then maybe we could have accomplished something a lot greater. Maybe we could have done something better in our city. Or wherever it is that we're going. So he said we're going to test you. You need to get to the sermon to know the perfect will of God. Everywhere that I go, people are always asking me, I want to know what God's will is for my life. Anybody ever asked that question here before? I want to know what God's will is for my life. What's God's will for my life? Man, tell me what God's will is for my life. You know, what's God's will for my life for college? What, what, what's God's will for my life for, for a career? What, what do you think God's will for my life is for marriage? And before I get to explaining to you what God's will is, let me hit those three things. A lot of, and if anybody in here is getting ready, a senior in high school, or you're getting ready to go to college or anything like that, let me tell you how you figure out what's the best college for you. Go and tour some college campuses and go walk the property and get a feel for that school. And if you're there, if your spirit doesn't feel right on that campus, get in your car, dust off your feet, and leave. And don't go back. That's not the place for you. But if you get to that college and there is peace upon you, 
That is the college that you need to go to. It's that easy. It's that simple. We make it so hard. Now, of course, finances have a lot to do with it, too. Because you can walk out there and be like, I feel peace, God. $50,000 a year? No, you're going to junior college. <laughs> Love you, but mm, <laughs> we're not taking another loan out on the house and foreclosure or nothing like that. You see what I'm saying? The other thing is, what is God's will for me for a career? What, what, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Let me, let me, let me say this. Do whatever it is you love to do. The Bible says that God answers the desires of your heart. And if your desire lines up with his desire, I've heard somebody say this, if you do what you love, <coughs> excuse me, if you do what you love to do, you'll never work another day in your life. You'll never work a day in your life because you love doing what it is that you do. I have a drummer. I had a drummer. He was my drummer for five years when I got to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Him and his wife just came back to visit. They've been gone for three, four years now, or maybe it's been longer than that. I can't remember. He's a brain surgeon now. This guy was my drummer. He was a weirdo. <laughs> just saying. The guy played rugby and would come on Wednesday nights with shorts way high for a guy. I mean, shorter than chubbies. I mean, he had on some shorts. You don't know what chubbies are? Don't worry about them. Don't even go and buy them because they're nasty. So he had these little short talk, and he would get up there and he would just bang on the drums and be, and he loved God with all of his heart to come back. And I'm just like, I'm like, look at what this guy's doing. He's a brain surgeon and he loves the Lord and his wife's pregnant and now she's got her doctor and she's going to be a pediatrician. I said, y'all are going to make a lot of money. Please tithe. <laughs> I know that you're in Birmingham, Alabama, and that's where you go to church, but you can send it up here if you want to. Remember all the time I spent with you? See what I'm saying? So here we go. What's God's will for my life for, for, for college or a career? What about God's will for my life for marriage? Half of you I see in here, you still watching Dora the Explorer. You ain't got no business even dating anybody right now. So you, you is Dora even out on TV right now? Maybe you got to watch it on Netflix or something right now. You're watching all these little My Little Pony and all that mess and, and Hugo and all. Listen to me. Listen, if you're in middle school, God bless you. God bless you. But you're not dating. You ain't going nowhere. Okay? And I'm sick of that. My, my daughter's an eighth grader and go, well, someone's going out with someone's home. They're going out. And I said, where are they going? They don't drive. They ain't going nowhere. Where are they going? You know where you're going? The bedroom, the bathroom, and back to the bedroom. And I'm locking the door. Because you ain't going nowhere. Period. Well, can I date when I'm in high school? No, you may not. You know what dating is? Can I give you my definition of dating? Can I? Dating is preparation for divorce. <laughs> Here's why. Here's why. Stay with me. You date, you break up. 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 You get married, you get divorced. Why? Because you've lived the lifestyle of date, break up, date, break up. You didn't like this one because of that. You didn't like this one because of that. You didn't like this one because of that. Then you go to get married, and then you don't know what true relationship means, honestly, because you don't have a relationship here. Yeah. And you're trying to find relationships out here. Man, I'm pretty good at that, man. Ooh, double my offering. Double my offering. So look. Look. So that's what we do. We date, we date, we date. We break up, break up, break up. And then we go to get married. And then all of a sudden now, I don't like them. Something else looks better. You're seeing it as other people see it. You're not seeing what it is that God brought together. So then we end up getting divorced. Here's what I tell everybody when it comes to marriage. First of all, high school. Uh, I'm... Uh, I don't even know what to say right here about high school kids. You guys, y'all are stupid. So anyway. <laughs> listen, I do, now just because I've got to explain this the correct way, I've got some seniors in my student department that are dating, but they have submitted that relationship. They have submitted that relationship, and they came and said, this is where you know it's true. Hold us accountable to what we do. Oh my gosh, I love that. Hold us accountable to our courtship and where we are and what we are doing. And I said, absolutely. We will help hold you accountable to that and we, will, we set up some guidelines. There's no pillow talk. There's no calling on the phone after 10 o'clock at night. What are you doing? I don't know. What are you doing? <laughs> and y'all just laying there hearing each other breathe on the phone. Hang up the stinking phone, man. Your parents pay that bill. Get off of it. I'm chasing a rabbit right now. Somebody shoot that thing real quick so I can get back on target where we're going. Look here. When you are ready and then I'm not going to say physical. Because, <laughs> but, 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 answer, tell me to go to church. Listen. <laughs> she 
who I am. I'm A.D. and when something goes off, and I'm going that direction. You know, if it would be a good song, it might have been a little dance or something, you know? Listen. You see what just happened? I have no clue where I'm at. Marriage! Hallelujah. Here we go. Here we go. Really, I'm still lost, but I will get there. I promise you. Kill that rabbit. It's dead. So here's what we do. I said physically ready. If we were to do this biblically, you were physically ready at 12. Bar Mitzvah in Jewish times, you were physically ready at 12. Most of them were married at 13 and 14. But that ain't this society. Okay? That ain't who we are today. So this is what I say. When you are mentally, which that just took care of all y'all. When you are mentally ready. I got moms and dads back there going, And so, and she didn't know what's smart. So here we go. So now what we've got is when you are mentally ready, financially ready, and you are running the race of God, look to your left, look to your right. Whoever the person is standing next to you, that is your spouse. Come on. Right. That is the one that you need to look for. Now, guys, listen to me. Make sure she's good looking. <laughs> be honest. There's got to be a physical attraction there. Because you don't want to wake up 15, 20 years down the road and roll over and be like, ha ah. ha. <laughs> why, why, why? So I told you I was going to get you. <laughs> God, don't do that. That was a lie. <laughs> Girls, same thing. Listen to me. Missionary day, don't work. You, you're, not, you're not fishing for... He looks good. <laughs> and then you're trying to pull him along and get him to come on, come on. says here in the scripture, listen, that you may test, testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. What are you doing right now? Look at me, look at me, listen, listen guys, God, we got to learn to pay attention. Don't worry about things that are moving around. You're going to have stuff moving around your life until the day that you die and you've got to stay focused. I call that part of your life to stay focused to attention right now in the name of Jesus. Good, acceptable, perfect. What are the things right now that are going on in your life that do not measure up to the goodness of God? What are the things that you're doing right now 
that you know that if God came down and did a survey in your life, that they would not measure up to the goodness of God. What is your, what are you doing in your life today, right now, before you even came here, that is not even acceptable in the sight of God? And the last thing here, what is it that you're doing in your life where you do not have the perfect one at the center of your life? Listen to me. We understand that. Nobody is perfect. Nobody's perfect. But when you have Christ Jesus in your life, you have the perfect one living on the inside of you. He is the perfect one. You understand the Bible declares that we can live this life without sin. We don't have to fall to temptation. The ones that fall to temptation and fall into the trap of the enemy are the ones that have not consecrated a lifestyle of prayer. Look at me. If you're not praying, go ahead and expect to get your brains kicked in every day that you walk outside of your house. It's going to happen. I'll go ahead and prophesy. You're going to get your brains kicked in. But if you will pray and seek God and write things down and follow after his voice, I'm telling you, your life is going to change and change drastically. But you need, to, I mean, you need to be as honest as honest can be right now and say, what is the things that I'm doing in my life that is not good? What are the things that I'm doing in my life right now that if God came and did a survey, he would know that it was not acceptable? What is it that is not lining up with the perfect one? If that answer is no tonight, then there needs to be a transformation in your life. Stand up on your feet. We ready? Come on. You can you can do whatever. You can start just keying away if you want to. You don't have to go into something. There we go. Let's do this. Can we bring the lights down. I like doing this because this gets your eyes off of the people around you. It's the only reason I like doing this. I like bringing the lights down because now it becomes intimate. When you understand how much your God loves you and how intimate He wants that relationship to be with you, things change drastically. I'm reading a book right now by John Eldridge called Father by God. And in the book, he declares and talks about the stages of a man. And one of the stages, it starts off as a young boy, then boys, we go through the cowboy phase where we play and we have cowboy and Indian games and we play all these little childish games. And he said, you go through that stage, but some of, the, some of those boyhood stages were cut short. They were cut short because of sexual sin. They were cut short because of divorce. Or they were cut short for some reason. And then they had to move from there straight into a warrior phase. And then that warrior phase was cut short. And then they went into the next phase, which is called the lover's phase. But they became a lover way, way too soon than what they were supposed to. And now they're stuck in this certain stage of their lives. And they can't step into becoming the king that God has for them or the sage later on in life. But you've got grown men, 60 years old, still dealing with sin situations and dealing with boyhood situations because they wouldn't allow the transformation to come. They would rather conform to what was around them. And I'm here to tell you tonight, especially guys, God wants you to be a lover. Not in the way that the world has said to be a lover. But in what he declares to be a lover of Christ Jesus. Look at me. This is what it will change. It will change the way that you view the opposite sex. So I'm, I'm talking to both guys and girls. It will change the way you view the opposite sex. And you will not allow infatuation of fleshly pleasure to ever take control of you again. You will allow the voice of the Holy Spirit to begin to communicate to you what real love looks like. I don't know why I'm even going there. I just felt like God had me say that right now. So I want you to bow your heads. Shut yourselves away with the Lord. This is how we're going to do this. If you're in here tonight, man, you have, you have a choice to make right now. If you say, I'm in here right now and I'm 
need to be transformed by God. That is my life. You've been talking about me. I've conformed or I've done things I know that I shouldn't be doing. And I've allowed my mind to run racetracks around. And I need to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I want my life to be good, acceptable, and perfect before God. If that's you tonight, lift your hands and that's me. I need a transformation in my life right now. Come on, lift them high. Lift them high. Say, I need a transformation in my life right now. On the count of three, man, I want you to get out of your seat and come to this altar. Come on. One, two, three. Get out of your seat and come right now. Transformation's about to happen. Come on. Transformation's about to happen. Get out of your seat. Come to this altar. Spread out. Spread out. Come on. Come on. Transformation's about to happen right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Can I say something before we get, before we get too loud? Look at me. I want to say something. No, no, no. How many of you guys are coming to camp? How many of you coming to camp? Raise your hands. Y'all are, are coming to camp when I'm doing camp. Right? Right? Look at me. Look at me. You are the only youth group that I'm coming to between now and camp. So I'm declaring over you change. I'm declaring that when you get to camp, it's another level of glory in your life. I'm declaring that when you get there this year, you've already been taking the steps of change, that there will be such a great anointing on your life that you will begin to change the other people around.